I'm Amanda I'm with Monterey Audubon Society, and we'll go ahead and get rolling here. Um, our itinerary for today, we're going to do a very brief introduction on uh, climate change and the impacts on birds. And then we're going to go through these six simple steps, um, actions, you could say, um, that you can do to help your local birds. Um, I've ranked them from what I think are the easiest to fix to maybe the, the more time consuming ones. Um, that's obviously a bit subjective, so it might be harder for you to do some of these things than others, um, but give it a good, uh, a good effort. The birds will thank you. All right, so our theme for this weekend is cultivating resilience in a changing climate, which is pretty appropriate. Um, some of the introductory um, talks were about, you know, extreme weather events, fires and flooding and ice storms in Texas. So, I mean, we know that these things are, are happening. Um, we're all seeing it in our daily lives. Um, and the global average temperature has increased by one and a half degrees Fahrenheit since 1800s, the Industrial Revolution. Some places on the globe are warming at a faster rate. Like the Arctic is warming a lot faster than the rest of the globe. So we've got changing temperature and precipitation patterns. There's increases in the ocean temperature, the sea level itself, and then the ocean acidity. And then again, those, those, that increase in frequency of extreme weather events. And so all this stuff is pretty undeniable. I hope you're all on board with the fact that the climate is changing, but climate science and meteorology itself is pretty darn complicated. I'm definitely no expert. It involves a lot of physics, a lot of chemistry, and not a lot of birds or wildlife. So obviously not, not my cup of tea necessarily, but I can recognize that there's loads of smart people and scientists doing work to try to understand and predict what's gonna be happening out there. But it's all about this energy budget. And so we've got energy coming in from the sun uh, into our planet, into our atmosphere, and it's either getting absorbed or reflected. Um, but there's these tricky things called feedback loops and um, negative feedback loops is when things are self-reinforcing. So as our oceans warm and the sea ice melts and the glaciers retreat, the snow cover decreases, there's less reflectance of that, of that solar energy back out into space. So we're absorbing even more of it. And so negative feedback loop is that sea ice is melting. We're absorbing more heat. The ice melts even faster. We absorb more heat. And so that's how it gets into a loop. And those are the things that like, you're really hard to predict where it's hard to say exactly what the temperature will be in 10 years, um, how much sea level is gonna rise. There's those feedback loops that are mysterious and a little challenging to predict, um, but also just, you know, the emissions is a big part. Our greenhouse gas emissions is what's driving this uh, human driven climate change. And we don't know what it's gonna be, you know, uh, 20, 2020 had a big drop in emissions just because of COVID. There was a global pandemic and people weren't flying and we're like, yay, low emissions, but that was just a fluke. You know, you, you don't know what, what we're gonna be doing if we stick to the Paris Climate Agreement, we might just have one and a half degrees Celsius of increase in temperature, uh, global temperatures by 2050. But if we do business as usual, uh, one of the models that's a lot of a, a higher emissions prediction, then we get like three degrees Celsius of warming. So, you know, it's all over the place, a lot of ranges. Um, so it can be really, it can be really complicated and make you feel very overwhelmed. And, uh, but that's okay, because <laughs> that's life, life is complicated. Um, and as long as we recognize that it's happening and, you know, it's really problematic for the living organisms that have to adapt to this like rapidly changing environment. That's where we can, that's our jumping off point. So, you know, how is this affecting the birds? There's some really direct problems, of course, like heat stress. Um, if it's 103 degrees in Death Valley, which last summer they hit that marker, there's birds that live there. And you can maybe take 130 degrees for a day or two, but if that becomes more uh, the normal around there, you're gonna be in, in dire straits. Um, there's also indirect effects like increasing mosquito populations, which carry diseases like avian malaria, and that's wiping out a lot of the native Hawaiian birds. So there's those sort of effects, but then there's a really kind of overarching problem that is related to phenology, and phenology is the timing of events when things happen. And so we're getting these weird mismatches. So like this bird, for instance, is a rock ptarmigan, and ptarmigans have this beautiful white plumage so that they blend in with the snow up in the Arctic. But if the snow is melting a week or so earlier, you are now a white bird on a brown surface and you're much more visible to predators and your chances of living 
go down. And it's not just the ptarmigans that have this strategy, you know, that, that white plumage or the white pelt. Um, that's something that Arctic hares do or, um, or Arctic foxes and snowshoe hares do that also. So that's that mismatch in the phenology. Um, but additionally, there's a thing called trophic mismatch and trophic is the food web. And so there's, this especially impacts migrating birds, birds that are trying to get up into the tundra. Um, they've timed it exactly right. So they're gonna arrive when all these bugs are emerging after the snow is melted. You know, if the bugs emerged a week earlier and they arrive there just like, oh, I need to get some food. Uh, they're gonna be very sad because there's not gonna be bugs. And that's where it, that becomes a big problem too. The condition of the birds decreases, their chances of having healthy chicks decreases and populations just start to dwindle. So um, those are the ways that climate change is really harming the birds. And so with that, we're, we've got uh, the National Audubon Society's Bird and Climate Change Report that was estimating that 64% of North American bird species are at risk of extinction from climate change. And they're kind of defining that, that risk as losing at least half of their current range. So where they're found on the continent, losing half of their range by 2080 due to rising temperatures and habitat loss. That's pretty shocking. Um, that's more than half, two thirds of these birds on the on the slide. It's a bad thing. Um, so here's a nice comparison of range maps. Uh, on the left, we've got the year 2000. If you zoom into the, the blue area, this is black oyster catcher range in 2000. You can see that they're all the way down in Mexico and then going up into Alaska and the Aleutian Islands. Zoom ahead 50 years and it looks like we're not seeing them in Southern California. We're lucky, it looks like we still have them in Monterey Bay, but a lot more restricted range. And so that's gonna be due to sea level rise and habitat loss. Those are the kind of things that, you know, we don't wanna see, <laughs> we would love to prevent. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, you know, where we're at. There's another paper that came out in 2019 um, that denoted that 30% of the birds um, in North America have disappeared basically since the 1970s. Um, they just, you know, kind of gone away. The, the populations aren't recovering. The new recruits coming into the population just aren't there. And so with that like really dramatic context, we need, you know, going forward, we need to try to make these really resilient populations, even our common birds, you know, we need to make sure there's a lot of them and that they're widespread so that they can have the flexibility to, you know, weather this climate crisis that we have. So then what can I do? You know, what can we do in our daily lives? And while it's hard to estimate how many birds die from habitat loss, climate change and things like that, there are some pretty clear direct threats that we can quantify and then that we can we can fix in our daily life. Uh, first one on the list is windows. So uh, it's estimated that about a billion birds are killed every year running into windows. And a lot of people get a little confused by this. Um, shouldn't it be obvious that you can't fly there, but looking at a reflective window like this one, uh, it reflects the habitat the birds want to fly into. So it's not that the birds are dumb, they, know, they don't know about windows. They didn't build windows. They didn't evolve with windows. So uh, they're a problem. <laughs> a lot of birds also migrate at night. And so the bright lights from skyscrapers or buildings disorients them, they can crash into buildings that way. But it's not just a problem of big metropolitan cities or skyscrapers. Um, this is a McGilvery's warbler, which I've never seen a live one of these birds. Um, I found him, he had to struck a window at the campus where I work. And these are all short, you know, single story buildings that are, you know, dark at night. And, um, you know, it's also, a, it's a problem in our homes too. So it's not just relegated to skyscrapers. So what can we do about it? There's some options. You can get some nice chalk paint and just let the kids go crazy, uh, draw, you know, all over the windows in the front. This lady did a nice tasteful, you know, vertical lines on her windows. There's decals you can get and also a window film or fritting, that's the little dots. Additionally, there's this uh, paracord you can hang. It almost looks like a Zen curtain and that kind of waves in the wind. Um, you also can just not wash your windows and the griminess will uh, make the windows look like a barrier to the birds instead of a pathway. On the website actually for uh, California Wildlife Day, Big Sur Land Trust uploaded a video about windows, um, birds and window strikes. So you should check that out. And additionally, the American Bird Conservancy, their website has loads of information on um, how to prevent window strikes. So if, if this is something you know happens around your house, if you've been at home and heard that little thud, 
and then gone out and there's a little puff of feathers, you know, maybe check out this website and see the options that are out there. The second thing that hopefully you can all think about is poisons in our household. Um, hopefully some of you got to see Antonio's birds, the falconer, he's got some gorgeous raptors that he brings around to presentations. And raptors are one of the groups of birds that are very much affected by this issue. And by poisons, I'm talking about rodenticides. So rodenticides are non-target. You put out a block of poison and there's no guarantee the thing that you want to kill, which in a lot of cases are just a little rat, a little mouse, uh, there's no guarantee they're gonna eat it and die. Um, they, all, they could eat it and then wander off and die and then get scavenged by something else. All these raptors will scavenge if they have the chance, coyotes as well, bobcats and even pets. So those chemicals, they move through the food web and indiscriminately harm and kill things. So putting out poisons is not a good answer for if you have rodent problems. Alternatives would be things like smart landscaping, trying to keep brush and bushes further away from the edge of your house, or just really shoring up all those little nooks and crannies or holes that you know allow entrance into your home. You could encourage the natural predators of these little pest species that you might uh, be seeing, or you know really targeted use of traps if you're gonna be going in that route. Um, but again, you don't want to have just a snap trap sitting out on a patio somewhere. Anybody could walk over and try to get that peanut butter and get their legs snapped. So um, definitely need to be careful with that. Another thing, another poison is pesticides. Basically anything that ends with aside is a bad thing. That means to kill. We probably don't want that in our homes, right? Um, so reducing the use of pesticides in our home is important, although most of the, you know, overuse of pesticides is occurring in industrial farms and settings like that. Um, but again, look for some alternatives. You do a, do an online search for pesticide alternatives for whatever the problem is. Um, aphids and scale insects on your plants, you know, mineral oil to coat them is a good option. Um, and also you can consult experts. California Native Plant Society is a great local group and the Monterey Peninsula College has a, a great horticulture department as well. And so, you know, the pesticides don't just deprive birds of a food source. It's also directly killing a lot of amazing pollinators that most of us want to be helping and supporting. So just try to say no to pesticides in your yard if you can. On the same theme of our yards, uh, the plants that we have out there equal habitat for our wildlife. So you can be really conscious about what species and what types of plants you're putting out on your yard or even patio. Um, native plants really are the way to go. Um, native bushes, native plants, they support a lot more species of insects than um, exotic plants that might be brought in from other countries. Um, you know, the native plants evolved alongside all these insects that want to either eat that plant or live on that plant. And so you're gonna have way more bugs on your native plants than you do on exotic species. And the, the plant, the native plant is gonna act like a bird feeder. You know, there's loads of birds that only eat insects. And so if you hang up a, a bird feeder, you're not gonna get kinglets and vireos. They don't eat seeds. So if you put out a native plant, that is a bird feeder. So there you go. Native plants are their way to go. There's lots of great local resources. Again, our California Native Plant Society, the Pacific Grove Museum of Natural History has a native plant garden. There's a Lester Rowan tree garden in Carmel. And again, the NPC Horticulture Department's pretty great as well. And then if you're ready to go and you just wanna buy some plants, there's some local retailers. Hana Garden in Delray Oaks is great. And then Griggs Nursery and Me Earth in Carmel Valley all sell native plants. And again, you have that added bonus of supporting native pollinators. And in most cases, you're reducing uh, water consumption. On the same theme of plants in our yards, you need to really be conscious here in the spring of any tree trimming or brush clearing. So uh, generally March through August, you should just try not to trim anything. Um, we've got Anna's hummingbirds that are starting to nest. A lot of those nests probably already have eggs at this point. This little bird's called a brown creeper. And a lot of you maybe have never seen one because they are the color of bark and they adhere to the trunk of a tree and just trip, 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 creep up and down it all the time. But they nest between the main structure of the tree and then the thick bark. And so there's this little gap in there and that's where they like to nest. So nearly every nook and cranny of your yard could be a bird's house. If you do absolutely need to do some spring cleaning, you know, uh, just sit maybe for half an hour and try to watch what's going on. What's the, uh, what's the, the feel of your yard? If you see any behavior like this, this is a female dark eyed junco collecting grass for her, for building her nest. You know, you really want to spy on this bird, you know, get really an army crawl, get a ghillie suit on uh, and stalk them uh, because they're going to be super secret. They don't want to 
you or any predator to know where their nest is. So it's really hard to find a bird nest. Um, but if you watch where this bird goes, or if you see a bird carrying bugs in their beak, you watch where they go. If they dive into a bush or, you know, they sneak along the edge of your house and then duck into a little bush or a little uh, pile of grass or something, you'll know there's probably a nest in there and you can avoid working in that area. So just trying to be conscious and really aware and also, um, you know, kind of grateful that your yard gets to be a habitat for animals. That's really cool that we have that. So the lazy gardener is a birder's friend or a bird's friend. Uh, just leave your yard scruffy and, um, you know, don't need to rake up the leaves. That's going to make mulch for bugs to be in. Don't need to cut off the dead flower heads. That's, you know, where the seeds are. Birds like to eat that. So nature really likes complexity. You know, they don't like, nature doesn't need manicured yards and nice straight lines. Um, a nice messy complex garden is, is where the wildlife likes to thrive. So the next issue we get to talk about is, you know, related to those other animals we love so much, our pets. This is my cat, Kimmy, enjoying some sun on the patio. Uh, but Kimmy is a killer. <laughs> I won't shy away from that fact. Um, she may be old and pudgy, but she's still quick on her feet. And it's estimated that 1.3 to 3.7 billion birds are killed each year by cats, by free roaming outdoor cats. Um, and so that's a really huge number. Uh, when I last gave this presentation in uh, 2019, um, up to that point in the year, there were 91 animals that were at the SPCA um, that had been caught by cat. And there's a place in the intake form, CBC, they have an acronym for it, it's so common. And so it's not just birds, brush rabbits, garter snakes, opossums, long-tailed weasels, and a Western screech owl. That's pretty shocking. And then hummingbirds. Hummingbirds are super fast, but cats are even faster. They're, they're really amazing top predators. And um, we have to be aware that we have this impact. So, you know, cats can go outside, but they should be under really close supervision or on a harness. Uh, this is Kimmy in the top right corner advocating for birds against her will perhaps, but she gets to go outside and eat grass, which she loves. There's also some other alternatives uh, like catios. There's some great examples of these around town. Um, bibs, bird be safe collars, and then bells. Uh, those three collar options, you know, they might help a small bit uh, letting the birds know there's a cat on their tail, but it's not gonna help your cat from getting into trouble. So one of the main reasons I first started keeping indoor cats was because I'd had too many instances of my pets being killed in the road. Um, it's really traumatizing and horrible and I, I didn't wanna go through that anymore. There's coyotes out there, um, really beautiful wildlife that wants to eat our cats too. So there's a really uh, strong you know, uh, case to be made for keeping your cats in just for their own safety. Cat, indoor cats live longer, healthier lives. And it's an odd double standard because you wouldn't let your dog run around at night and chase deer or kill a fawn and bring it home. Uh, that would be horrible. And I think everybody would unanimously say that's bad. So why cats are allowed to do it, I do not know. Um, we definitely need to be responsible for our pets and the domestic animals that we've brought into these native systems. So on the theme of dogs, they really need to be kept on a leash if you're not in a designated dog park area, um, especially at our coastline parks, uh, especially on the beaches. You know, there's loads of migrating birds um, trying to get up to Alaska, get back down to South America, and they just need, you know, one more, one more mouthful of food before they can keep going. They're always almost at the brink of death. Wildlife don't have the luxury of just taking a day off or, you know, getting drive through food and just relaxing. They're not usually plump and, you know, just ready to laze around. Most wildlife is really, really working to just stay alive. And so a, a joyous, exuberant dog having fun and chasing the birds back and forth uh, is super disruptive to them. So just, again, try to be conscious. These, these state parks and these areas on the coastline, most of them are protected and that's the, the home for the wildlife. So try to respect their home and respect them. Uh, the next issue we always can go on about is plastics. Uh, there is going to be a talk at 1230 about microplastics in Monterey Bay. So certainly check that out if you want to hear more about the horrible issue of plastics, which are um, pretty pervasive. They're everywhere in our homes, they're in every room, they're in our cars, our food's wrapped up in it. Um, so it's a big problem. Uh, you know, it's estimated that 9 million tons of plastic go into the ocean every year. That's pretty shocking. That's a huge amount. Uh, this bird here in the lower picture is a Laysan albatross nesting on a beautiful heap of debris. Um, it's estimated that they cumulatively feed five tons of plastic to their chicks each year. That's pretty bonkers. 
um, these top pictures show these birds, a gannet and an osprey, you know, using nesting, uh, using plastic debris as nesting material, which is really dangerous. You can see this osprey here, he got entangled, uh, fell off its platform and hung there and died. It's a horrible way to go. Um, entanglement's one of those things that I hate seeing. And um, we see it a lot though around here. This is a, a beach survey at Del Monte Beach for a, a local organization called Beachcombers that I participate in. And this is a pretty common sight. Uh, seabirds, these are common mers uh, wrapped up in monofilament and fishing line hooks and sinkers just dragged them down. You know, they're rolling in the surf and just slowly dying. And it's a, a really horrible way for wildlife to go. And plastic, all this is man-made stuff that we interact with and it's, it's tangible. It's one of those things that we can really consciously think about and try to, you know, reduce our consumption and reduce our use. And that's, you know, it, it does get a lot bigger than this as far as the systems in place that keep pushing plastic on us. But individually, you can try to refuse that, and then also reduce, reuse, recycle, like we learned in school. Um, just try to say no to those single use plastics. Hopefully we're all on board with that. Um, and additionally, if you like fishing, uh, definitely try not to cut the line, try not to lose your gear and recycle any monofilament. These recycling bins are usually seen at uh, popular fishing areas or at the docks around here. One of the final and more fun things that you can do to help birds is to participate in and support, support community science. So um, there's a lot of good options online and apps. Uh, iNaturalist and eBird are two of my favorite that are good for submitting observations, but also for learning and getting information about what's seen in the area. Um, I'm sure Connie yesterday talked about the Western Monarch milkweed mapper um, and then beachcombers I mentioned briefly. So these are excellent community science things that you can get involved in that help you learn, but then also contribute to science. Um, and there's also examples of really specific community science efforts that have um, you know, a specific research question or a research goal in mind. So our local Monterey Audubon Society, we hire a seabird biologist to stand at Point Pinos, which is you know, the point out there in Pacific Grove where the bay sticks out into, uh, or the land sticks out into Monterey Bay. And we hire a seabird biologist to stand there basically from dawn to dusk for the whole month of November and count all the migrating seabirds that are flying by. And so this is loons or scoters, which are a type of sea duck, uh, common murs and different alcid species. And then this is in conjunction with the Pacific Grove Museum of Natural History. They send down docents to then talk to the public about seabird conservation, ocean issues, and then kind of run interference between the public and the guy who's counting one bird, two birds, three birds um, as they fly past. Um, so that's a really fun effort. And hopefully this November, we could see you down there as we're uh, looking for cool seabirds. But there are loads of groups out there, especially locally that are working on this issue, just trying to make our, our world better, making our community better. And um, here are just some examples. You know, Return of the Natives is an excellent, excellent group that's planting native plants and doing restoration work around the area. Uh, the PG Museum we've mentioned a lot. California Coastal Cleanup Day is always a fun event. This was our 2019 crew. And then of course our Regional Parks District and the Carmel River Watershed Conservancy. There's so many great organizations that you can either volunteer with or you know, sponsor events like this or maybe work for one in the future, things like that. Um, again, we're just really lucky and it feels really good to be involved and help out. Um, when we start getting down, you know, to the nitty gritty element of what the problem is, you know, big picture, it's all about carbon emissions. And so local politics and city planning, um, if you really want to dive in, this, this can start to become all consuming. Um, it can be hard to get started because it's hard to find city council agendas or when they're meeting. Um, but once you get going with it, it becomes a little easier and, it feels like really, it feels really good because you're directly talking to people who are making big decisions, how, how our taxes are being used. And you often are talking directly to the mayor or directly to a city manager. So, you know, your voice is being heard. So this is that classic adage, you know, think global, act local, because it does all add up. And if we all get involved and, and use our voices to help the environment um, collectively, something good will happen. So there are a lot of organizations here uh, in the area that, um, oh, sorry, I was hearing sorry, something. I need to interrupt, but I just want to let you know that there's about three to two minutes left of this session, okay? Okay, last couple slides. 
Communities for Sustainable Monterey County. Um, there's chapters in lots of local cities you can get involved with. And since, you know, ultimately our goal is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, you know, these organizations might not directly involve wildlife, but, you know, the work they do is going to be helping wildlife in the long run. So we need to think about branching out into those fields as well. But yeah, you know, uh, let's keep the common birds common and protect those who need the extra help. Uh, you know, similar to the passenger pigeon, abundance sometimes obscures decline. And the fact that we have four, 24 million meadowlarks still alive hides the fact that 74 million have gone away since the 70s. And, you know, but we can all play a small part and make these improvements in our daily lives. And that could save a bird's life. And that really does matter. So thank you so much. Thanks for listening. And I uh, hope you, we can see you out there on a bird walk someday with the Monterey Audubon Society. Feel free to get in touch and I'd be happy to take any questions. Awesome, thank you, Amanda. So yes, just as she said, if you do have any questions, you can go ahead and unmute yourselves or send your question into the chat. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Amanda. Questions. My Who's name is there? Anthony Scott. I have a um, My name's uh, Anthony Scott. Um, Hi, Anthony. I'm wanting to know, mm -hmm. are you, I, I saw this, um, <laughs> I dive in, I do the research. I saw that you are doing bird walks still potentially at Asilomar on uh, Wednesdays at 10 a.m.? I is, wish. I think we're, we're still kind of, okay, we haven't okay. opened back up since COVID yet, but we're getting really close. But if you keep watching, oh, 12 o'clock, that's the cat feeder. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> if you keep watching the website, hopefully those will be starting up again in the next couple of weeks, but I still don't have the approval right. from my boss though. Right. Sorry. All right. Most definitely. Okay. Yep. Um, so we do, we do um, Facebook live. If any of you are, are on Facebook, our Silomar State Beach Facebook page, we do Tweety Tuesday lives the first Tuesday of every month. And same kind of stuff, me walking around, pointing at birds and talking about right. them. So right. join in. Yeah. No, Thanks. Definitely. Um, and thank you for clarification on feeders. I recently oh, yeah. took a hanging feeder out, out of a tree in front of my home. It was yeah. kind of like an ongoing moral dilemma. I just made the choice that, okay, dude. I'm comparing it to like a human eating fast food, me exactly. putting the feeder out there. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I was like, okay, I got to get right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You, you want them all around, but then you realize, I mean, they're still all around. Yeah. <laughs> it's a complicated <laughs> issue. Right, yeah. right. No, I know it. But, and just unfortunately, I can't control, you know, the planting of plants on the property I live on because I have no yeah. ownership in it. <laughs> I don't even have a yard, you know, so a lot of us, don't right, know, right. it's hard, um, but, um, right. you know, you can get involved like Return of the Natives. They do a lot of mm -hmm. planting just in our parks. And I kind of right. feel like our local parks are my yard because I, right. I don't have a right. home. I'm not going to have a yard anytime around here, but, um, but our parks, that's our yard basically. Right. So no, get involved I, I, there and try to maximize those areas. Yeah. No. Um, yeah, I don't know what it's like in COVID times, but <laughs> I do in, I do, do intent. And yeah, as great. I Thank you. Live Thank here you. on the coast, uh, I wish to get yeah. involved. So um, yeah. if, I don't know if I could reach out via email, maybe. Yeah, you sure can. My email's I, here yeah, on the yeah. screen, monteryaudubon at gmail.com. If you have any bird related questions, how to get involved. Yeah. Um, I've got my fingers and a lot of pies around the area related to birds and plants and such. So I'll give you some recommendations. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, any other questions out there? Yeah, we have a couple of questions. Yes. A couple of questions. Okay, uh, this is Sarah, and I had a cat who attacked a baby blue jay. Hmm. Yeah. And uh, I tried to kill the blue, blue jay. Oh, Sarah, you're breaking up a lot. I don't, if you type it in the chat, I can read it potentially. The parents were oh, calling constantly, mm -hmm. and that's what it's called. That the cat, the cat never came back. Um, is is that an occasion to take the the bird to the SPCA? Yes, exactly. I'm glad you brought that up. Anytime you see if a bird hit your window and is just lying there, if a, your cat caught a bird, you know, get those birds uh, into a little bag, into a box, someplace safe and contained, and take them to the SPCA from Monterey County. They're located on Highway 68, and they even have staff that are on call. So if something happens at 
you know, 9 p.m., your cat brings in a little baby quail or something random, you can call them and they have people on call and they'll even come pick animals up if you're, you know, you, you don't have a car or you're somewhere down in Big Sur or something random, they have staff that'll drive out. But um, if you can take your injured animal to them, that's very helpful. But always call first because sometimes they can, they can talk you through maybe what you're seeing, like a bird hitting a window. Sometimes, you know, you just need to keep it contained for a little bit so it can recover. And maybe after 20 minutes, if you open the box and it flies away, it's good to go. <laughs> so give them a call. That's always a good, good move. Yeah. Nice to see you, Sarah. Yeah. Nice to see you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> yeah. You're welcome. Yeah. After that, my other cat is just indoors now. Oh, well done. Well done. That can be a hard transition. My cat Kimmy was an outdoor cat for a long time and she's, she can be very loud about the outdoor issue and <laughs> tell me her opinion a lot about the, the whole inside concept but we try you know it's just like having a dog yeah i take her out as much as i can we play a lot more indoors it's a really nice relationship with an indoor cat than with all of my outdoor cats they kind of were like i don't need you amanda <laughs> they just would leave um so it's a nice feeling yeah oh, great mm -hmm. oh i do yeah. see uh, a question here in the chat about um bird feeders and bird baths uh, making birds sick that has been uh, the spca speaking of them they've been putting out a lot of um uh press announcements about needing to take down bird feeders and bird bats. There's a specific finch species called a pine siskin that have been in our area a lot this winter and salmonella is being spread around it, between those, those birds and they are really uh, susceptible to it, them as well as goldfinches and house finches. So yeah, that's another reason to either, you know, keep a close eye on your feeder, clean them at least weekly or just take them down entirely, especially if you have those big flocks of siskins showing up and just pigging out because they're, spreading that disease all around. Yeah. Another question real quick I saw from David Bush. He's asking about, uh, have anybody approached architect, architects or buildings regarding windows in the state? And um, I haven't done anything about that or heard of any efforts really. It's always tricky. You have to kind of pick your battles in conservation because we have limited people and money and resources and such. Um, but I know there's been a lot of great work over in Maryland and Toronto. If you wanna read about some really great um, city um, ordinances related to building design, Toronto um, has put in some really great rules about how to design buildings so that they're not as harmful to birds. Um, so that's a good, a good city to look up. They've got some good stuff on the books already. Yeah, anybody else? I'm seeing a lot of thank yous, which is wonderful. You're welcome. Um, I came, so I have a in. question. Yeah, hi, go ahead, Christy. Hi, I um, came late to this because I was with the Condors for a while there. Oh yeah, it was a good talk. <laughs> yeah. And I was wondering, um, and what I heard about having bird feeders was not to, I just got uh, somebody pose that question. I had al always heard that, um, putting uh, hummingbird feeders was good because the hummingbirds uh, need need their food more direly than other birds. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah. Oh, okay, sorry, was there another another part of that question? Well, I just wondered about it. I had not heard not to put out feeders ever. So. Yeah. Well, it's always just a matter of, um, you know, uh, are, are we cleaning them? That's a, that's a big part of it. You know, if you can put up a feeder and know that you're going to clean it regularly, the hummingbird feeders also can spread disease. Avian pox is a common, common disease that's spread around feeders at apartment complexes and stuff. You'll get these hummingbirds with really lumpy malformed beaks. And then oh. they're spreading that around as they're all sticking their beaks in these feeders. And so those also need to be cleaned. So it's just that it's almost like being a pet owner and being really responsible, you know, clean up the old seed, clean up under the dishes, take down and clean the feed and bird baths because it, it is um, kind of unnatural to have so many different species and high numbers face to face congregating at a dish. And if they're standing in the dish and pooping in it rah, 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 yeah. and they're eating it again, it's like it starts to get tricky, you know, and, um, and how often, how often and with what do you clean it? Usually I recommend once a week and with like a bleach solution, something you'd use to like clean off like your counters or something at home, just like um, mm -hmm. what's the dilution? I don't remember it. I shouldn't quote it because it'll be wrong, but you can look up online. There's been a lot of great posts either on uh, the National Audubon website or Cornell Lab of Ornithology about how to keep your feeders clean because they uh, most of those organizations have like bird feeder cams where they have cameras set up and they have a feeding station. So, you know, uh, as long as you're doing it right, it, it can not be harmful. You're reducing the harm. 
of them. And they're so, so enjoyable. That's that, that com complexity yeah. where some people that might be the only way they can engage with nature because maybe they're homebound or something. So, um, I don't like it's to just say no feeders ever, you know, but, um, everyone just needs to be try to be conscious of the effects that we're having the larger effects so exactly um, yeah. I'm glad I asked that question because yeah. I know of people that get a lot of um, enjoyment out of yeah. out of their yeah. feeders so exactly. okay yeah. good thank you so much yeah, thanks for asking yeah Amanda how about bird houses yeah, well, I got a bunch of birdhouses I monitor and um, those can be really great as well. But similar to the feeders, you need to keep an eye on them and make sure that they're a good design so that they're not kind of a, a trap. You know, you don't want it to get really hot in there and, and get too hot for the baby birds. You don't want it to be in a location where a predator can get to them easily. Or there's another complexity with there's some uh, non-native invasive bird species. I'm using air quotes because that always feels mean to say about birds. It's not their fault that they're here. People introduce them. But European starlings and house sparrows, they outcompete a lot of our native songbirds for nest sites. So if you put up boxes and then they're using them, that would be kind of counterproductive because then you're bolstering their population. So you have to, again, keep an eye on the box, keep an eye on your feeders and try to, um, you know, kind of just understand the situation in your area. It's almost location specific. Um, I've got a bunch of nest boxes up at, at Asilomar where I work. And if you have any questions about, about building a box or what kind of design you should get or where you should put it, you could certainly email me and I'll give you all the information I have from monitoring these boxes over the last seven years. So that's been really fun. And it is super great. There's loads of, um, not a ton, maybe five or six species that like to use nest boxes locally. Um, Cause there's loads of birds that don't want to go into a dark like hole, uh, which is what a box is replicating a hole in a tree. Lot, lots of birds just want to nest in a canopy of a tree or down in a bush. So they won't use the boxes, but there are some species that do. And if you have those in your area, yeah, putting up a box can help support them. <laughs> Oh, okay. Yeah. My, my, my woodpeckers live up there in that post and they have a oh, perfect yeah. home. <laughs> and, oh, and great. At least it's not in your house or something. Woodpeckers no. are notorious for drilling homes. Drilling oh in yeah, they're doing it in my, on my roof. But um, oh, no. <laughs> I love it when they fight for uh, territorial, you know, because there's predators mm -hmm. that want to get them and predators are also good. Yeah, them. yeah, yeah. That's great. It's but cool that you get to see them there. Yeah. yeah and, um, the acorn woodpeckers of the Monterey Pines apartments that cache in, in all the walls of the complex. Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> oh no. My grandmother lives there. So it's just pretty, yeah. Yeah. Oh, God. It, it's funny. Yeah. Acorn woodpeckers, and that, they're really unique. They cache acorns, and no other woodpecker really does that to the extent that acorn woodpeckers do. And yes, mm -hmm. if you have a lovely, like, cedar shingled home, that's up for grabs to them. They're going to drill holes and stick acorns in there. And even if the acorns fall into the siding or that gap, uh, they keep adding more. <laughs> and then you just have a house that's surrounded with acorns. Oh, yeah. They're funny. Um, oh, I see a question in here about um, bird baths. Bird baths can be managed the same way. I think that might have been Christy, Christy who asked that. Um, yeah, cleaning those out, scrubbing them if they've got like buildup of algae or debris. Um, and then also she was asking about bird silhouettes on windows. And so that's related to the, the decals you can buy, those little stickers, you know, and they have clear ones that are supposed to be, you know, ultraviolet. The birds can see the UV, but we can't. Um, but a lot of that's about how many you put on, because if you do one just in the center, there's still a lot of space around the edges that birds will see as a pathway through, and then they'll hit that. So it, it's a little discouraging because people think they can buy just one sticker and put it in their on their window and that's the problem solved. But if you go to that American Bird Conservancy website, they have a whole link about windows and they'll tell you specifically kind of the spacing you need to have so that birds don't hit these windows. And they do a bunch of research on it. They have these tunnels. They'll have windows at the end with decals or no decals or different arrangement of decals. And then the window with no decals and a net in front of it. And then they let a bird go and see which one it goes towards. So they do a lot of research on those products that way. So yeah, the American Bird Conservancy uh, Bird Strike Window Strike website, check that out. It'll have some good answers for you. Yeah, and anybody yeah. else have any questions there? Let's see, I'm scrolling through the chat, but it looks like we might have had it. I think we have all of our questions covered. Wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone, for dropping in and saying hi. Good to see you all. I see a lot of familiar faces. Good to see you all. And um, yeah, be sure to reach out again. I think hopefully our uh, Audubon email is up on the slide still. Reach out. I'd be happy to talk to you more about bird stuff. And um, 
yeah, hopefully we can all see each other out there on the trail someday, someday soon.